I'm grateful today uh, to Craig Pickthorn, who will be our technical support and checking out the uh, chat room, uh, answering any questions that you might have. So let us get going. My name is Deirdre Pike, and I'm a member of Hamilton Basic Income, a Hamilton-based group to inform, educate, and engage our community in the basic income concept. As we gather for today's event, Women and Work, the case for basic income. It is important to ground this work in a greater context. I invite Carrie Lubrick, a member of Hamilton Basic Income, to acknowledge the land from which we join today and the need for dismantling the ongoing legacies of settler colonialism. Carrie. Thank you. So before we begin this important conversation, it's essential to ground it in the acknowledgement that from wherever we are joining this meeting today, for those who are non-Indigenous, we are settlers and we are guests on this land. The city in which I sit today is situated upon the ancestral Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee Confederacy land as determined by Gish with one spoon wampum. With the, with that agreement. It is also an area with long-standing relationships with the Mississaugans of the Credit First Nation and the Six Nations of the Grand River. Almost all of us here today are somewhere on Turtle Island. If you know the traditional name or the territory of which you are seated, please say it now, out loud, or in the silence of your heart. We are grateful to the Indigenous people of Turtle Island who have cared for these lands since time immemorable. We hold our hands up to their amazing resistance, resilience, and strength in the face of ongoing disposition and colonial violence. To acknowledge these lands is to take one step in demonstrating our commitment to beginning the process of dismantling the ongoing legacy of settler colonialism. May we bring that same commitment of spirit of truth, seeking and reconciliation to our conversation today. And so it be. Thank you, Carrie. And welcome Senator Pate. I'd like to thank the partners of Hamilton Basic Income uh, who supported us in this event today, the Hamilton Roundtable for Poverty Reduction, the Hamilton Community Foundation, the Ontario Basic Income Network, and the Social Planning and Research Council of Hamilton. We are grateful for their support, leadership, and advocacy within the basic income movement. It's my role to keep things moving in this hour, and I want to let you uh, know if all goes well in that camp, there will be time for questions and engagement in the last 10 minutes of our gathering. So until then, we'll keep it going. Uh, before the Ontario Basic Income Work organized the Women in Basic Income case, they launched the case for artists and basic income. As a way of connecting that work today, we have two artists with us. The first is Laura Yates, a local musician and supporter of basic income. Lori, take it away. All right. Good morning, everybody. Nice to see you all. Hey, little darling, why are you crying in the darkness? You're crying over something that you never ever had. Said I always love you, but you couldn't send the madness. So you took away the one thing that you thought you'd always have. Crying in your bed isn't gonna make anything alright. You gotta brush your tears away. Like a phoenix rising in the sun, it's hard to start again as one. You gotta chase those fears away. Precious treasure, one reckless moment. Did it slip right through your hands? Love turns to 
torment No one needs a pleasure You're better off alone With the memories that you have Crying in your bed at night Isn't gonna make anything alright You gotta brush your tears away Like a phoenix rising in the sun it's hard to start again as one You gotta chase those fears away That Thank you. is more than it. That's fabulous. <laughs> Thank you so, so much. It's a great, uh, great message for today. Chase those tears away. Yeah. I've put in the chat uh, all a lot more about Lori. If you'd like to um, see more about her, she's, uh, we are trying to um, minimize time by putting uh, the bios of our fantastic speakers in the chat room today. So, uh, and you're going to hear more from Lori at the end of our time together. So thanks, Lori. Thank we'll see you a bit later. Now. <clears throat> there are many important things to say about Josephine Gray's contributions to cultivating human rights based solutions to humanity's greatest challenges extreme inequality, non-sustainability, and climate chaos. Check the chat for more details shortly. Josephine is no stranger to Hamilton, having helped organize and present to the North American Basic Income Conference here in 2018 as a member of the Basic Income Canada Network and Basic Income Toronto. Welcome back to Hamilton virtually today, Josephine. Thank you so much for being with us. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having me. Um, well, there's a lot to say about our need for basic income, obviously. Um, in the midst of a pandemic, in a climate emergency, as our economy is unraveling and finally revealing how absurdly badly designed it is, um, we can certainly see the disproportionate impact on women everywhere, all over the world. Um, including here and um, in my neighborhood, which is the most probably the most diverse neighborhood in the world and very densely crowded, we're seeing a lot of struggle with women, um, particularly the newcomers who've come from afar. And at the same time, we've been during this pandemic seeing a lot of people suddenly realize that everything isn't quite as it should be and that perhaps we need a lot of things to change. And we've seen a political shift towards a recognition and understanding that, you know, if people can't meet their basic needs, then we don't even have an economy. So, um, you know, we can see from the women in my neighborhood who are trying to feed their seven kids, their five kids, their extended family in a concrete jungle um, in this new land that um, basic income is becoming a matter of life and death, in fact, for a lot of women. I'd say the same goes for many indigenous people who have been essentially stranded on little pockets of land um, where they can't meet their basic needs in the traditional ways. And what this all makes very clear, I think, hopefully to everyone is that why we need the basic income so badly now is not only to ensure that a family can meet its basic needs, but not only to ensure that women have more choice and freedom of movement and are able to make decisions that are um, best for themselves in their children, their families, and not predicated on whether or not they can afford um, the rent in this particular place or another. I'm sure that will still exist, but it's not just that. It's that we need to have massive transformation across our society towards far more sustainable practices, towards more sustainable livelihoods, towards more sustainable um, behaviors and practices and community projects and the like. We simply can't do that without time. 
people have to have time in order to be able to make change. People have to have time in order to be able to restore their health. They have to have time in order to be able to raise a family in, in a real way, uh, raise a family in a way that we know traditionally is so important is when we have connections between uh, the men and women of, of the family, between the elders and the young, uh, between the generations and between the neighbors and the family. All of these things require a lot of time. And this is what we've lost. Our time is colonized over the last decades, centuries. Our time has been increasingly colonized to the point where women have been squeezed to the maximum. So we see women rushing out to their part-time jobs, dropping their kids at daycare, rushing back, picking them up at daycare, cramming in a quickly processed meal, the woman who made that processed meal is also rushing off to another part-time job, which she may or may not get paid. It's just outrageously chaotic with precarity nowadays. It's outrageously um, abusive, really, to women in particular, um, and poor women in particular. But all women, I would say, and all people in our society um, are lacking in their human rights, and we do not have autonomy, sovereignty, to be able to choose what we do with our time. And we knew, when we know that massive change is necessary, but we don't have the time to make it, then what kind of society are we living in? And I think ultimately we all know, all of us deep in our bones, that we're facing enormous challenges and risks and dangers, particularly as mothers and grandmothers, feeling that on behalf of our children and our grandchildren. And I think we all know that it's gonna take a lot of time and energy and work. It's gonna take a lot of people coming together. And that's not, remotely possible within our current paradigm. If we do not have a basic income, we will not be able to make the kinds of changes that we're going to need to make in order to have continuing generations. If we want to walk the dish with one spoon wampum, if we want to preserve resources in the Great Lakes region for future generations, we're going to need a basic income in order to be able to make the changes necessary to make that possible. So I'm really glad today that we're getting together and I Shout out to Hamilton, my favorite other city. I'm speaking from Takaronto, the meeting place, and I really feel more and more hopeful at the same time as stressed out <laughs> that we're gonna be able to get here. And uh, when we see a basic thing come come, it's gonna be a new day and women are gonna have a chance to rise and we're gonna see the kind of equality that we never dreamed of. Thanks. Wow. Thank you so much, Josephine. That's uh... That's sure something to uh, dream about right there. That kind of equality. We appreciate that very, very much. There will may be questions and so on. As I said later on, please put them in the chat. Uh, Craig and I will be monitoring that room so that you have an opportunity uh, if you'd like to engage with uh, Josephine. Next up, we're going to switch back uh, just for a minute to that theme of art that I mentioned at the beginning, the Ontario Basic Income uh, Network uh, led a, a number of in, uh, initiatives, case studies around basic income. This one that we're focusing on today about women, but we are also uh, intersecting with the one that they started with around art and uh, artists and basic income. So our second uh, contribution to that kind, that part of the con uh, conversation today is from uh, Hamilton person now, although I did meet her originally in a in her little town Hanover where I lived for a while uh, but I'm so glad that we both ended up in Hamilton. Jesse Gollum uh, you may know is an artist with many platforms including photography and music. Today we'll see her photography examples so I wanted to tell you about something else that I learned when I was doing a little googling. Uh, Jessie's an accomplished classical pianist. I knew she taught piano lessons, but she was a finalist in 2015 of CBC's Piano Hero, a national contest for pianists, ending up in the top 15 out of hundreds of pianists from across the country. Uh, and Jessie is well known uh, in these last couple of years as the creator of Humans of Basic Income. Uh, as a participant herself on Ontario's Basic Income pilot project, uh, Jessie took up this um, uh, this effort of uh, making uh, doing a photo study of people who experience a basic income pilot project in Ontario, and today she is here to share three of those stories with a gender lens. Thank you so much, Jesse, for making time for this. 
Thank you so much, Deirdre. And um, it's been it's an honor to be here and an honor to be sit sitting on this panel with such amazing, inspiring people. Um, I have a great deal of respect and admiration for every single one of you. So I'm really, really, really glad to be here. Um, I think I'll just go straight into it. Um, Deirdre asked me to pick three stories um, from my portrait series. Um, so back in 2018, just in, in people don't know, and I will um, post a link in the chat. Um, the, I was on the Ontario Basic Income Pilot and um, it was abruptly canceled um, despite the um, incoming provincial government promising not to cancel the pilot. Um, so out of my fury, <laughs> I um, reacted by um, finding the other basic income recipients and asking them a very simple question, um, what did you use basic income for? And then um, the answers to the question is what informed my portrait series and the answers were very, very, very powerful. Um, so and then when it comes to women, it also like helps. It, I saw firsthand sort of like the inequality and 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 that these people and myself included face um, both in, in a very systemic way and then being able to see how basic income leveled that playing field and and helped to fight that inequality and then to see it taken away again it was and still is to this day very jarring um so um craig um can we be able to uh put up some of my images let's let's start with one i mean right up okay i do not see that i see uh your your craigslist <laughs> good one yeah that's a, that was a good one There we are. So um, I met this woman in Thunder Bay. Uh, she asked to be anonymous in the picture because she said that the father to that child does not know that that child exists. So she is getting no support whatsoever um, as a single mother to raise this child. Uh, clearly, the relationship that she was in um, with this father was abusive, um, enough to a point where she does not want this child to have any contact with the father whatsoever. Um, basic income allowed me a chance to recover my future. It gave me hope to provide a secure and better future for my baby girl. It gave me the confidence to keep my baby then rather than being forced to give her up for adoption. My family felt relieved to know my daughter and I would have a fighting chance as a single mother. It significantly reduced my depression, anxiety, OCD, which allowed a secure attachment to flourish between me and my baby girl. I was able to be a better, more attentive mom. I focused on my baby's needs rather than ruminate about my own unmet needs. As a result, my baby is well-adjusted, healthy, and a happy girl. Basic incomes for children. It gave me the confidence and incentives to apply for good jobs, knowing I had a safety net to catch me if I didn't get the job. It um, helped got me out of my need to use a food bank. I could afford to eat real food. It allowed me to save up for a down payment on a house. So this allow, basic income allowed this woman to be a mother. It allowed her to keep her child. It allowed her to um, give her child a healthy and loving environment to grow up in. Um, it, it was, it's very, very important for her. Um, I, I, I don't know how, how more to emphasize that. I think she, she does a good job on her own. Uh, let's do another picture. This is Sarah, Sarah's a Hamiltonian um, and a friend of mine actually. Um, basic income alleviated my stress when my income wasn't enough each month. I'm precariously employed. I'm a full-time student and a beginning manual therapist in my community. And around the time that this picture was taken, um, Sarah was going to school um, to study to be an osteopath. Um, and she, um, she owns a house, um, but then she had to work um, at a, jo a job at a bar um, in order to pay for her schooling. Um, so, and the bar that she was working at was a very dangerous bar. Um, she'd be up late at night. Um, oftentimes police were called um, because of bartending, bartenders and stuff. Um, and, um, and she'd be up late at night working and at this bar in these really crazy dangerous conditions and then up early, early in the morning to go to school and study. Um, so basic income gave her that um, support that she needed to be able to focus exclusively on her studies and going to school instead of having to work at a bar in order to pay for it. Um, and now she works as a full time osteopathic doctor and is helping in our community working downtown. Let's look at another one. This is Jamie. 
Um, basic income um, used to um, I basic income is the income used to qualify me for housing subsidy. It feeds my children with special needs while I'm being dragged alone through our broken family court system, seeking disclosure for child support and getting poorer. I'm waiting for FRO to proactively enforce a previous child support order from a father who has never paid child support, who is now over $35,000 in arrears. And it's this story is particularly heartbreaking in that the, the father can get away and not take responsibility for his child and get away for, with paying child support. And she's forced alone through a court system. And I remember afterwards spending time with her and her telling the story of having to navigate through these court systems on her own without re representation to fight for the rights of her child and fight for her rights as a mother and a woman. Um, and, and it's just crazy to see just how glaring that inequality is. Um, we can turn off the screen for now, Craig, if you want. Um, thank you. So, yeah, so like we can kind of see, like, I think that these stories kind of speak for themselves um, in, in terms of how basic income gave these women opportunities. It gave them chances to pursue their dreams and chances to um, it's spend time with their children and give their children um, a healthy and safe upbringing and gave them the chance to be mothers. Um, and I, I think these stories speak for themselves. Um, so yeah, I just want to thank you for this opportunity and, and thank you for, um, for inviting me to be on this panel and to share some of these stories. Um, I'll post a link in the comments um, to the portrait series if you want to look at them. In total, there's about 70 portraits that tell all these powerful and incredible stories of what a basic income can do and how it can positively change people's lives. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jesse. Uh, I see that there's uh, somebody said hello to you in the chat from a city that looks like it might be from one of your world travels, is it? Um, I saw that at the beginning. So um, I, I met her um, last year in Hyderabad, India, um, when I went to the Basic Income Earth Congress there. Um, it was incredible experience. I was one of three Canadians at the entire Congress. Everybody was from everywhere else. And it was really incredible to meet basic income activists from all over the world and also represent Canada and share my stories there. So yeah, that's great. Thank yeah. you again. Thanks for being Thank with you. us today. Thank you. You're muted. Next up, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Tracy Smith Carrier. Tracy is the chair. Are you still the chair of uh, London's basic income effort? Yes. Yep. In London, Ontario. Uh, a place we have in common, including King's College, uh, where Tracy is, uh, has a number of uh, really important roles there, but her um, particular area around social policy arena is connected to social welfare benefits and social assistance. And that's how we've definitely worked together in the past and food income security, food and income security, and of course, basic income. And that's why she's here today. And uh, we will put more about her uh, career and her um, um, connection and commitment to human rights. And today, of course, is December 10th, uh, the uh, Human Rights Day. And so um, I'm glad we're all marking it together like this. And so thank you, uh, Tracy, for being here with us for this day. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. Um, I just want to start off with um, looking at some research. Actually, it's a uh, McKinsey and Company. It's a global management firm um, doing research across 11 countries across the globe, including Canada, found that only one in six people of diverse groups, and they um, basically define diverse groups as being members of the LGBTQ community, parents, people with color of color and, and women. Um, so these people uh, in these diverse groups who are still working, so recognizing a lot of people weren't, um, but only one in six said that they felt more supported by their employer um, over the course of the pandemic than they did before. Um, so what we're seeing clearly is that in a lot of cases, people are, when people need help the most, um, they're not being supported. 
And so at first, uh, researchers were saying, you know, that, that COVID is really sort of highlighting the existing inequities um, in Canada. Um, and then as, you know, time moved on, you know, we started to realize it's, it's not highlighting it, it's actually exacerbating it, it's making things worse. Um, so women are, you know, represent 70% of health and social service providers uh, worldwide. So these are women that have the most exposure, the greatest exposure to this deadly virus. And half of women are working in the uh, five C's in Canada. So they're working in the caring sector, clerical, catering, cashiering, cleaning. These are generally low waged um, retail service and caring sector work. So really, really hard, um, hard work that tends to be um, paid lower. And um, in the case of disasters or health uh, crises, they're, they're often the ones that are the first to lose their jobs. So women have lost their jobs at two times the rate of working men. Um, and so a lot of them have also seen their working hours curtailed. And um, so, yeah, we're really starting to see the, the you know, exacerbation of these inequalities and how the pandemic has had such a, a greater impact on women than it has on men. And that not only, um, I mean, talking about work, but also the work that they're doing that's unpaid. So the work that they're doing uh, in the home. Uh, so what uh, Arlie Hochschild used to call the, the, the second shift, right? Where you do your work at the job and then you go home and do your work at the home, um, added by the third shift. So all the emotional and mental labor that women engage in. And then we'll just throw on even more and suggest that they need to be to uh, tutors to their kids and, and homeschool uh, providers as well. So, I mean, just a context where, I mean, Josephine already mentioned the fact that people's time really being crunched. Um, and so some of the more recent um, research coming out is suggesting that um, a study by Quinn and Fuller suggests that those in double, double jeopardy um, are, are those that are particularly hard hit are people with less education, living in low income, and with school-aged kids in particular, even more so than, than kids that are, have, uh, are parents that have preschoolers, that women um, in that, that bracket, um, less education, low income, school age kids, really double jeopardy. Um, so what is this um, amounted to? Well, Davenport and colleagues have uh, recently come out with a paper, paper called Moms Are Not Okay. Uh, we're seeing higher rates of internal depression and anxiety in pregnant mothers. We're seeing um, females and people who are younger at a greater risk of experiencing psychological distress and um, likely as a result of all these factors together, increased reports of gender-based violence, upwards of 25 to 33% uh, increased uh, uh, domestic violence, intimate partner violence. Uh, when we think about intersectionality, so the multiple intersections of women, including um, race, disability, age, and so forth, um, almost 80% of the women that have been working as AIDS and long-term care homes in Montreal have been racialized women. Um, and racialized groups in particular have been um, most pressed to try and meet their financial obligations and basic needs more so than um, non-racialized groups. So what are we supposed to do to address these disturbing trends? Uh, recently, Prime, Prime Minister Trudeau has stated that Canada will not be moving towards a basic income. Um, let's consider what this path actually could, though, provide for women. I think it's important first, though, that we are all sort of on the same page of what a basic income is. Um, it is a regular payment made through the tax system to ensure that everyone has income security um, built on the principles of uh, adequacy. So it has to be enough money to live on, has to provide autonomy, offering people more choices, dignity, no strings or stigma. Um, equality of opportunity and non-conditionality. So offering um, a benefit with no strings attached. And, and universality of access, the last one, anybody who needs it should be able to get it. So if we actually looked at that and considered an individual benefit um, that was provided directly to individuals and not at the household level, this could actually enable women's economic independence. It would give them more choices about whether to pursue further education or training, whether to start a business, whether to stay at home to raise a family, to leave a toxic job and get another one. 
um, that essentially would give women more bargaining power in employment. And actually that's what they found in, um, in Dauphin, Manitoba, in the, the Minkum study, Kalnitsky did a, a study to say that the wages of the workers went up um, because of having a, a basic income. So it definitely will have a positive effect on the labor market. Um, and also would give women more flexibility in determining their hours of work and um, having access to finances, of course, will allow women to leave abuse, re abusive relationships, as we know that that income, having access to income is one of the most significant, significant factors in determining whether a woman will stay or leave. Um, so let's, let's consider what those common critiques are and kind of deal with them head on. The first one is the cost argument. And the reality of it is, is the, the parliamentary budget officer has come out recently and said that it's actually more cost effective to have a basic income. And it would have actually been cheaper than um, providing the temporary benefits of the CERB and the, the Canada recovery benefit. Um, so we sort of missed out on a, on a great opportunity there. Um, but we know that the system we have now is a very, very uh, expensive system and it's an, an ineffective system. So um, this really is an investment in people's lives. And so the cost argument we could probably set aside for a moment. So the work disincentive argument is the common one that we hear as well. This notion that people will stop uh, working if you give them a benefit. And the reality of it is, is that there is now research to show and from, from basic income pilots across the world that, um, that this is just not the case. People don't just stop working because they get benefits. Um, there is, uh, in, in countries of the, the global south actually, they, they actually have seen um, increases of, of labor force uh, participation in countries of the global north, we've seen modest uh, decreases in some of our basic income pilots, and those are really having to do with the fact that people want to, to leave the workforce and pursue um, education and, um, and possibly stay at home with their kids for a little bit. Oh, so there, there essentially is my eight minute mark. Uh, We're ahead of time. Timer. We're ahead of time. Carry on. All righty. Um, so why should we why should we consider it? Um, because it works. Um, it's been tried all over the world. And there is quite a huge literature base now now talking about basic income. And, um, and, and the reality of it is, is Canada is a very wealthy country. Um, we pay less in our social um, and health transfers um, our, I guess our total uh, public social expenditures as a percentage of our GDP is one of the lowest of the OECD uh, countries. Um, pretty much all the other countries in the OECD are, are above us. We don't pay a lot for our health and, and social welfare. Um, we actually spent in 2018, paid half of what Denmark and France spent. Um, so certainly have a ways to go. Um, and, um, I mean, some considerations of how we might get around the whole cost thing is, you know, we're one of the, the, the only G7 country that doesn't have a wealth tax, a gift tax, an inheritance tax, and we're the lowest G7 country um, for corporate taxes for wealthy corporations. Um, we also tax our, our workers at a higher rate than we do um, capital gains and dividends for rich people. Um, the, the, this is problematic for me. I mean, like, why are we not tackling the tax system that seems to so generously provide for people who are very, very wealthy? And let's face it, the Amazon folks and the, the high tech people are um, doing exceptionally well in these times of COVID. COVID and um, the working, the average working person is is really, really struggling. So we must move towards a basic income. It's effective, it's just, it's evidence-based, and it really will engender more choices, more opportunities for women. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, I see a couple of questions questions coming in. And uh, again, there will be some time for that uh, very shortly. And uh, uh, so that you can follow up with Josephine or Jesse um, as well. And uh, now, and they're also engaging in the chat room. So feel free. Uh, it's not like uh, 
you know, cheating in school, if you use the chat room, we encourage that to, uh, to encourage engagement and, uh, and to get more information. So next up, I would like to, I'm very, I'm very honored to introduce Senator Kim Pate. And uh, uh, the Senator also has um, at least one connection to Hamilton that I'm aware of. And that was uh, through the Elizabeth uh, Fry Society, which she was, uh, um, you know, for uh, responsible across Canada, the Canadian Association. And here in Hamilton, she was uh, present to support our own Elizabeth Fry Society at various times. And now here we are on the same side of another equity and justice issue as the Senator has uh, come out and uh, encouraged other senators, uh, about 50, I believe, uh, to sign a letter uh, encouraging and calling on the prime minister in this government to bring about a basic income. We, uh, we need that kind of support from this kind of a woman and we are very happy to have her with us today. So thank you, Senator, for being here. Thank you very much. And please just call me Kim. Uh, so many have known for a while and uh, if ever it looks like I like that title or anything else associated with this office too much, you're now part of the group to hold me accountable and knock me down. Um, and I apologize, I may have to leave a bit late. I've um, Some of you may have seen that I um, uh, introduced uh, an amendment yesterday that would basically, uh, you know, um, end a supply bill and this being, you know, would be a problem for the government. And I basically, when I heard the prime minister last week say that he couldn't see uh, the way forward for a basic income, I was so frustrated that I'm just trying to figure out every possible way I can to try and keep on this. And so thank you to all of you who do this all the time. Um, for those of you who I haven't uh, met before and may not be aware, uh, the entire reason really that people who wanted to put my name forward for the Senate were able to convince me to allow them to, I didn't think I'd ever get here, but um, there was the work I wanted to do on substantive equality issues, including the need for uh, guaranteed income, guaranteed livable income, the need for uh, adequate child care, social services, health care, dental care, pharma care, mental health care, and um, in the type of work that you've all been doing all your lives. Joe and I have known each other back to the and National Anti-Poverty Organization days and her amazing work. And so uh, that was really what brought me here. It's what, um, you know, when I was appointed uh, four years ago, I realized, okay, I've got 18 years unless I cark it before or quit uh, in the Senate and uh, we better get it in. And then the pandemic hits. And some of you know, I had introduced an inquiry in the Senate, which is basically putting out to everybody um, in the Senate, this is something I'm interested in, who else is interested? Um, when the pandemic hit, uh, less than three weeks later, uh, or at least when the lockdown started in Canada, one of the things that um, became very clear is how CERB um, paved the way for what is, uh, is possible and how quickly the government was able to pivot, use the CRA roles, get people on the CRA roles who weren't already, and move towards um, more basic income types of initiatives. And so we have it obviously with the child benefit, we have it with the guaranteed, um, the income supplement for seniors. And there's no reason we can't have it for everybody and that we shouldn't get rid of the very judgmental criminally low social assistance rates in this country and uh, shore up the national standards and guidelines that are needed, not just for income, but also for health, education and social services. And so that's really what I intend to continue to do. That's what I came here to do and that uh, I consider myself responsible to all of you and all other folks in the country. And, um, you know, the fact that we still have three and a half billion, a million, sorry, three and a half million, one in 10 Canadians basically, still not eligible for any kind of benefit during this period is absolutely a travesty and unconscionable. And so um, I will continue to work on that. And uh, I don't think I need to say much more. I'm happy to, to hear it from all of you who are experts in this area. And um, and from those who are tuning in and any questions, you know, if I can't answer, I'll try and help find the answer. Thank you. Oh, and I'm sorry, I should have started out. I come to you from the unceded, unsurrendered territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabek. And um, I just I just did two other presentations this morning. And so I, I apologize. I think my brain has gone on 
synapse lapse somewhere or you know mental pause and so my apologies for that i take that very seriously and uh and my oversight is mine alone so thank you thank you very much kim and we do know how seriously you take it and also uh you know it, again, what a uh, gift it is for you to be with us when you are uh, doing so much important work. And each person here, uh, as you know, uh, has that same kind of commitment. And um, uh, I'm grateful for all of that. And so uh, now uh, with this uh, great panel of people, you'll see that they allowed for extra time for questions. And so I've picked up a couple in the chat room and uh, great, uh, Craig, you can, um, let me know if you've seen others. But uh, here's one to start with that Lorna asked. Since Justin Trudeau has said not now, basic income, how do you see this coming into being? Do we not need to change our voting system to a proportional one to allow for more diversity of voices in Parliament? So I wonder if a couple of you want to take a, a go at that, anybody? Josephine, please, Joe, if I may. Yeah, I mean, of course it would be, we would be making a lot of better decisions if we had proportional representation, if we had a um, more re realistic democratic um, system for sure. Um, obviously that's as big a fight as pig, um, something that has almost happened, but not happened. Um, I think what it tells us though, is that the more wide the range of voices that push for a basic income, and if we continue to push for it, I mean, at least they were in a position where we had to say something. So that's a huge change from some of us have been at this for decades. And um, it was like a scary secret nobody even wanted to utter the words until very recently. So um, I think it's a sign of, you know, first they deny you do to do. I think it's a sign that we're making a big impact and not that long from now, I have a feeling that they're just gonna to have to give in and let it go because what's gonna come up is how ridiculously clunky and clumsy and inefficient their um, pandemic relief programs were and how much trouble those have caused. And there's gonna be more and more trouble because now they're saying, oh, some people have to pay it back and who pays it back, who doesn't pay it back? And I'm watching their bureaucracy just implode with complexity. Like we were doing kind of the summer jobs. We couldn't get a hold of them. Our kids didn't get paid till months later. I mean, if we have all these obligatory, you know, policed programs and everything else, you have to actually be able to run them. And like, they're not even able to do that anymore. Like, it's just, it was so clear that, you know, this, this kind of judgmental and controlling income support systems are, they're defunct, they're obsolete. They don't even, they don't even work. So like if I'm waiting two months to pay uh, youth who are employed, um, so two months after they were employed before they get paid um, for their first day of work, you know, too many things are broken. We need to create a whole new way of doing this. So I think it's going to become abundantly clear that we have no choice and the government's going to have to do that, but we just have to keep the pressure on. We can't say, oh, well, he said no, let's just you know, wait around or wait for a better day. No, it's, it's a sign that we need to say yes more loudly. Great, yes, thank you. Uh, Kim, would you say yes to uh, wading in on that a little bit? I know you touched on it already in your opening remarks, but you might add something else. Yeah. I do think it is vitally important that um, anybody who's interested in running, my daughter is 21, is now, because of what she's seeing the government not doing, interested in running for office. Go figure. I would never have guessed that. And so I do think that we need more people who understand these issues. What's interesting is yesterday, one of the criticisms I re received for what I did was that I'm not ele an elected official and that I shouldn't be trying to interfere with the uh, government in this process. I can't imagine a better, you know, a, you know, a, we're part of the role of senators is supposed to be to represent what's often referred to as minority interests. You know, if if we're not supposed to speak up, then what are is our use if we're just here to be what furniture? And you know, I'm, and so the reality is, I think um, all of us speaking up and saying it's just not acceptable 
for the prime minister, especially in this time, to be saying, wait, not yet. We can't see a way forward. Um, they can see a way forward. They just choose not to. And we, I think we have to keep the pressure on in whatever way we can. And when I say we, I think I have a greater responsibility to do that than you do. But I think we all need to in whatever way we can. And so um, I know we all will. And, and, you know, I think part of it is making sure your member of parliament and the senators from, you know, there are 24 senators from Ontario, make sure they know what you think. And, that in fact you want to see this in place and that the prime minister just saying, you know, he can't see a path forward yet is just not good enough, especially in Ontario where it was the Liberal Party who introduced the basic income pilot. There, of course, is the way forward. They know they have a, a template right in front of them. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Anyone else on that question? Then let's take a look at number two. Gail wants to know, is basic income being tested in certain areas right now? And I would add to that another question connected to it. Uh, is there a place that is doing basic income well, a country similar to ours that's doing it well? Is there anybody that would like to tell us a bit about that from their knowledge? Tracy? Uh, sure. I actually... Um... I was going to show you um, a slide that had, um, but it says that I'm not able to do that. But um, basically, there are lots of income or, or cash transfer programs that have been tried around the world. Um, Latin America, almost every country in Latin America has an, a conditional or unconditional cash transfer program. I guess the, the problem with some of those is that they do actually have conditions attached to them. So they do kind of deviate from our understanding of um, basic income in that they should be non-conditional. Um, there are a few places around the world that, that are operating basic income pilot projects, Kenya, uh, for example, and Leeds um, in UK has uh, just adopted a uh, resolution to provide a basic income as well. Um, so, I would say there's a, there's a lot of literature related to um, cash transfer programs, and actually some literature that would suggest the more conditions you have, uh, the worse the program. So um, New York City, for example, tried out a basic income pilot and they had 22 conditions. And what they found out is they spent all their time and the money and the administration kind of trying to capture the 22 conditions that it uh, made it a very expensive program. And it's totally unnecessary, as we know, to actually have those types of conditions on people. Um, so, uh, yeah, there's a lot of literature talking about just giving money to people. People know how to spend money. <laughs> they spend it on, on the things that they need. Um, and, uh, yeah, a wealth of literature. If you're interested in, in kind of uh, hearing about um, new um, countries and places around the world that are, are adopting basic income, the Basic Income Earth Network, B-I-E-N, um, kind of does provide a lot of updates um, about what's going on globally in relationship to basic income. So I'd recommend you checking out that, that website. I think you could share your slide if you did want to. Oh, okay. So it's kind of colorful. <laughs> um, you can see all the different places in the world. And this is not a fully, fully comprehensive list. There's a lot more other places that have also um, um, tried out basic income. But um, like I mentioned, a lot of those Latin American countries, so places like Brazil, Nicaragua, um, Scandinavian countries like Finland, um, of course, in um, Ontario and Manitoba, and even BC has um, done their own uh, pilot. Um, countries in Africa, Namibia, Kenya, uh, Zimbabwe, Malawi, um, India, uh, Iran, like it's all over the place really that there are, are different types of programs and some might, we might have some debate over whether they're truly basic income if they don't meet the full sort of principles that we discussed earlier but um, lots of lots of literature on providing income support for citizens directly um, and the, the benefits of doing that. Thank great. you so much. Great. That's great. That's great work. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, hmm. So, question here: Is there a risk that a Canadian basic income guarantee might lead to 
suspicion toward recent immigrants that they are here just to claim money. Might it become more difficult to become a permanent resident? Josephine. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I live uh, in the neighborhood which is essentially the landing strip for newcomers to this country. And one of the interesting features about our community is that over 45% of our people have higher education. Um, and that's, you know, there's uh, non-newcomer folks. So if we're like majority newcomers and 45% of them have higher education, one thing you need to know about those immigrants is that it was a hard journey to get here. They had to qualify. They had to jump through a lot of hoops. They had to pay money um, to get here. And at this point, many, many of them are finding that their big, huge journey to the promised land was a mistake, that they were duped into believing that they would have opportunity here. They find that they are running from one horrible little part-time job to another, that no one takes their credentials seriously, that their experience in running hospitals and farms and you name it is not, not taken seriously here. So if they, newcomers who come here with all the skills and knowledge and qualifications that would help build our society and all their uh, abilities are able to get a basic income, more the better. Would people come here in part for that? Of course they would. But they would also be coming like everybody else would want it and need it. And hopefully, if we push hard enough and we do have a global movement, basic income starts to become a thing all over the world. So we wouldn't be the only place where everybody's mobbing onto it, but someone's got to start. We help start um, healthcare. We help start public social healthcare and that spread everywhere. Same thing will happen with basic income. But also I just want to make sure that people understand that the people who create the most jobs who work the hardest and who have paid the most price to be a Canadian are newcomers. Indigenous people were Canadian before anybody else. So they've paid a horrible price to still be here. Um, but newcomers pay a very heavy price to, to be part of our country and part of our society. And um, you know, we've done in the last few decades, we have absolutely violated their human rights and deprived them of their opportunities. So it's well overdue that newcomers are also able to receive a basic income. Thank you for that powerful response. Here's a question for Senator Kim Pate. What is the most effective way for citizens to speak up about our support for UBI? What is most impactful? Petitions, letter writing, phone calls, et cetera. Well, I think, you know, one of the things I didn't know before I was here is how uh, quickly mass emails get dumped into a spam category. And we, we may see the first bunch, but then we don't see them after. So I do think, you know, people sending notes, even if it's postcards, you know, um, is, you know, then the mail gets through, you know, they're not going to stop mail coming through and phone calls even during this time most of us have our phones forwarded i mean i'm in my office right now but nobody else is and uh, but the phones are forwarded either to me or to evan or emily who are in our you know who are the team here and so uh phone calls messages if they're emails then personalized um emails are you know always better just like personalized email but if you're you know if you're strapped for time then I think even if you did a mass mailing um, but sent it through postage and remember that if you're mailing people on the hill members of parliament or senators you do not it's you do not require any postage so uh, people can you know write a note on a napkin if they want to and send it so uh, toilet paper you know maybe that's maybe now's the time to be writing it on toilet paper and sending them all to us <laughs> Um, sorry, that was just a processing through my mouth moment, but you know, it's pandemic. So, um, yeah. you know, and one of my favorite, those of you who are old enough to remember Claire Colhane, who um, did a ton of activism around all kinds of issues, including workers' rights and prisoners' rights, um, routinely would take paper and reuse it. I mean, she was one of the first people I saw recycling and we would get, you know, even envelopes turned inside out and just a stamp cross out, you know, and usually it would be government documents. She would send, you know, a letter or a note to us on the back of, or, or to, not to us, but to people in these positions. So, 
yeah, I think getting the information, but also whatever you can get in terms of opinion pieces. I think Jesse's work getting out there when uh, senators saw those images and, you know, I know some of them continue to look at them. Those are vitally important. So the, and, you know, the work of Lori and others in terms of the, the work the artists have done, that got a whole bunch of senators interested who previously probably would not have said they were interested in basic income because of course artists frontline workers um, new canadians were all the people who the poorest were the ones who were most uh, devastatingly hit by this even if they were um, you know, it, whether they were working or not working and so thank Great. you so much for that um, and I wanted to ask you, uh, Sen Senator Kim, sorry, I know you don't like being called that, um, if, if, if you would like to use those photos, if they would help um, convince um, the Prime Minister and the members of Parliament. Well, I think getting people to send them to, uh, you know, there's a whole, they're all on Twitter. If you yep. put a tag Canadian Poly, C-D-N-P-O-L-I, almost yep. all of the politicians are following that. So hashtag, we need a basic income. Actually, that would be great because so many of them are on Twitter. We need a basic income now. Um, and especially, you know, we're working up to the holiday season. People supposedly feel more generous. And I, I sure I shouldn't say supposedly. That sounds terrible. But, you know, I mean, I think it's a time to remind everybody that we still have, despite everything that's been done, we still have one in 10 people in this country not, not having their um, needs met and living well below the poverty line. Yeah. So yeah, a media campaign right now would be great. Say happy holidays. I hope you're having happy holidays. Don't forget these people. We need a basic income now. Yeah, great. Sorry, I'm just, well, that's just, you're all, you, I'm sure you can come up with something better, but that's just off the top of my head. If we're looking for a long hashtag, I think you've got it there. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but it's great. And those are all great ideas. And again, in the chat room, so many good ideas about the potential of uh, you know, what to use to, whether we could ever make postcards with uh, Jesse's photos and, and have some impact there. So I really appreciate all of that uh, happening. And now we are uh, one minute away from the end of our time together. And so I uh, want to um, turn it over just for one second to uh, Keenan Loomis. He's the CEO of the Chamber of Commerce uh, here in Hamilton and has uh, uh, become a great advocate for basic income. So I'd like him to give you a little uh, few words about the next thing we're doing. Thank you. Thanks, Deirdre. I really appreciate that. And uh, it's really a great honor to share the agenda with such an august group of uh, people who have been warriors on this issue for far longer than I have. But uh, yeah, I guess so. Um, the next uh, luncheon will be on February the 11th, and it will be uh, basic income and small business. Uh, so I hope that uh, all of you can join us and uh, we could talk about really the economics um, behind basic income. So many of you have talked about the impacts uh, to individual lives and social outcomes and all that. And, and those are all fantastic reasons to be supporting basic income. But, uh, you know, in, in my industry, it's about do the economics work. And uh, so I think there's, there's a lot of uh, fuel there. Uh, yesterday, I don't know if you saw, but the Cancia report on uh, basic income uh, was launched and there will be a launch on Saturday. Uh, and uh, it is studying the, the economics of, of basic income. So a lot to talk about uh, on February 11th, and uh, I'm really looking forward to it. Great. Thanks so much for that. Uh, as Joe called you, Mr. Businessman, good to see you on board, <laughs> <laughs> is what it says in the chat room. So thought I'd let you know you got a new title. All right. Um, but it really is important. We need people from every sector, obviously, obviously this is a, and so that's what's so great about having you on board. And as we bring this to conclusion today, we're gonna to turn back to the arts sector. And so as I say, thank you to each one of you who participated today, especially to all the members of the Hamilton Basic Income uh, group that uh, you don't see today, but John Mills and Jeff Martin and Lisa Alfano um, and uh, uh, Carmen Vian have also been part of this and Carrie Lubrick organizing this. Then to have Jesse, who is always uh, there, and uh, Joe to join us from Toronto, or the you know the way that you want to name your own territories as you would, and uh, Kim, and Tracy and Keenan um, and Craig Pickthorne, thank you so much for your help in uh, the technology today. Uh, I see we've had people from Slovenia and India uh, besides 
Hamilton. And uh, we will do this again in February. And in the hammer kind of tradition, we will uh, mix up our metaphors and have some uh, art and music singing us out uh, as uh, we've gathered here for this very important message. But we always have to uh, do what we can to uh, keep some levity, right? And so here we are, Lori, sing us home. Thanks, everybody. Somewhere down the road to good intentions There are too many heartaches to mention You've had them all, you never learn You flirt with disaster, you always get burned Time after time, laying on the line, why don't you look them in the eyes? Time after time, the saint will be fine, don't tell them any lies. Sometimes you start off with arms wide open. Sometimes you wish for a kind word spoken. Sometimes you don't know what to believe, and you only see what you want to see. Time after time, I lay it on the line, what you look in the eye. Time after time, I say it'll be fine, but tell me any lie. So when you're feeling down, all alone You can't get a friend on the phone The best you can do is to trust your heart Call me if you're falling apart Time after time I'm laying on the line Why don't you look them in the eye Time after time, I say I'll be fine. Don't tell them any lies. Time after time, I 